Hi everyone. Taking a look today at some footage that I shot when I was at the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum for Oz Armour Fest 2024. And this is the museum's example of the Sherman Firefly that was a variant of the M4 Sherman used by the British and Commonwealth forces during World War II. So it's an upgunned version of the M4 Sherman that took the original medium velocity or dual purpose US Ordnance M375mm main gun and replaced it with a British designed QF 17 pounder anti-tank gun. It was used by the British and Commonwealth tank units in Western Europe and Italy late in World War II. And this particular variant would have been termed a Sherman 5C by the British. 5 or Roman numeral V meant that it was an M4A4 Sherman and the C meant that it had undergone the 17 pounder gun conversion. Now as I've mentioned in other videos, the British struggled for most of World War II to design and build an effective cruiser tank. A cruiser tank in British doctrine was an armoured vehicle designed to have high mobility, to spearhead breakthroughs into the enemy's rear, and to have a gun that was capable of engaging other tanks. The loss of their pre-war armour in France in 1940, the lack of a large volume manufacturing capability for armoured vehicles, and the lack of effective cruiser tank designs on paper led the British to using infantry tanks like the Valentine um, in the cruiser tank role and to rush, rush unreliable vehicles like the Crusader tank into service in North Africa. Consequently, British cruiser tank units were equipped with Lend-Lease vehicles from the US like the M3 Grant and the M4 Sherman for most of World War II. Now, as the planned invasion of Normandy, which was slated for mid-1944, approached, commanders within the British Royal Armoured Corps became concerned about the capability of the guns that were mounted to the cruiser tanks, to these Shermans, to engage the increasingly heavy German tanks that were being employed in North Africa and on the Eastern Front. Vehicles like the Tiger I and the Panther were armoured more heavily than it was thought that the standard M3 gun that was on these Shermans would be able to cope with routinely. So that 75mm gun had made up most of the British, Commonwealth, French and Polish tank units that were slated to be used in the Normandy invasion. Now early in the war, um, and in the mid war period when it was introduced, that gun that was fitted to the Sherman could engage the early war Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks that the uh, British were encountering in North Africa quite well. However, late in the war, even the Panzer IV were starting to be up-armoured to fit 50mm and later 80mm of frontal armour. And that meant that this medium velocity M375mm gun would struggle to knock them out in, in a head-to-head -head duel. So the British had been developing a replacement anti-tank gun for their six-pounder since November 1940, and that had resulted in the QF-17 pounder, which was a 76.2mm anti-tank gun. Highly capable, and it would be able to deal more readily with these heavily um, armoured German tanks that were starting to appear. However, it weighed in at over three tonnes when it was mounted on a carriage, and so it wasn't a very mobile or handy solution for anti-tank units. So manufacture of this 17 pounder gun started in April 1942 and the carriage banner weapons for use by anti-tank units were rapidly deployed to North Africa and were started to be used from about October 1942 and they were also used in 1943 in Italy. And it showed the capability of this gun to engage armoured threats. So getting this gun mounted onto a tank, onto a mobile platform became a priority. The planned future cruiser tanks that the British had in the works, like the Cromwell, were undergoing significant delays, and the turrets, as it turned out, would ultimately be incompatible with this 17-pounder. Consequently, the British kicked off studies to work out how to fit this 17-pounder into the Sherman turret, and that commenced in about mid-1943 and started to gather pace in October, as engineers worked out how to fit the gun into the turret, um, how the ammunition um, could be stowed, how to manage the recoil of the 17-pounder in that turret, and how to manage the crew ergonomics um, in, such a, uh, in, in such a compact vehicle. So the work to remanufacture M4s in the UK um, in order to use this gun um, and, and take advantage of this potent 17 pounder, that commenced in January 1944. And by the end of May that year, just ahead of the uh, um, uh, Operation Overlord, about 340 Sherman Firefly conversions had been deployed to units that could take advantage of them during the day to day operations. So that's a little bit of the why and how the Sherman Firefly came about. Let's talk a bit more about the what of this particular tank, which is always an adventure when talking about uh, M4 Shermans. So the definition of major Sherman variants is based on the engine and powertrain that's fitted, rather than the hull or the turret of the main gun. So this vehicle started out as what's termed an M4A4 Sherman, which meant that it was fitted with the A57 Chrysler multibank engine. So it has a hull that's slightly longer compared to other Sherman variants. This is effectively um, five six-cylinder engines that are mounted radially around a common crankshaft. So what it produces is a 30-cylinder, 20.5-litre petrol engine that developed about 276 kilowatts. 
but with a high emphasis on torque. This example um, here at the museum, however, has been retrofitted with a Ford V8 engine, which was normally fitted to the M4A3 Sherman. So that just confuses things a little bit. These double doors you see here, that's a hallmark of the M4A4 um, uh, Sherman. So it's a good identifier if you're trying to work out what, the, uh, what sort of Sherman you're dealing with. So as with all Shermans, you've got a rear engine with a front transmission and drive sprocket. This example has the vertical volume suspension, meaning that there's three two-wheel bogies per side with upper return rollers and a skid plate. The track that's on there looks like it's the T48 track, which has outside guides, double pins, and rubber chevrons that are molded into the, the rubber facing to provide extra tra traction, but they're, but they're pretty heavily worn. Now the front glass, glassy plate on this Sherman um, is angled back at 57 degrees, meaning that it's more reclined than some other Sherman hulls, resulting in smaller hatches for the driver and the radio operator that have bulges in front of them to try and create some, uh, some more space. You can see here also at the back of the turret that a bustle has been added. This is a rectangular box was welded on to create space for the radios that were relocated to the back of the turret in the uh, Sherman Firefly as the, uh, as the radio operator's position in the hull had been uh, eliminated. Now the turret that's here is the um, D5878 turret, which has this pistol port on the uh, rear left and also applique armor on the cheek that was trying to counteract some, uh, some weak spots or some thin spots in the uh, original turret casting and to try and uh, just strengthen up the hull a little bit. So all of this information, that pistol port, the cheek armor, suggests that this turret was manufactured between about mid-1942 and mid-1943. So like all of those Shermans, it was built with a single split type hatch for the, uh, for the commander and there was no loader's hatch as built by the Americans. However, as part of the firefight conversion, the British added a, um, a loader's hatch, which you can see there, that's the rectangular hatch that's on the top of the, uh, on top of the turret. So as I mentioned, one of the um, parts of the conversion uh, process for the Firefly was to remove the, the, the front radio operator and bow gunner's position to create more storage space for the 17 pounders ammunition. It's quite long and big ammunition and so more stowage had to be found. So the gun eliminated the, um, the, the bow machine gun, but it did retain the burning 30 caliber machine gun that was mounted coaxially with the 17 pounder in the turret. So looking from the side here, you can see that typical Sherman suspension. As I mentioned, you've got the vertical volume suspension with the two road wheels and the outside um, guide horns on the track to keep the track centered on uh, those road wheels. And at the top of each bogey, you've got the uh, the return roller and the, um, and the skid plate, so three per side. This suspension didn't have a lot of travel in it, but it was sufficient for the purposes of, um, of most applications of World War II. There's the, um, the front drive sprocket at the, uh, at the front of the tank, so that's where the final drive is. Now as a uh, M4A4 Sherman, it was built at the Detroit Tank Arsenal, um, which was designed by Chrysler, and all of those tanks, about 7,500 in total were built there, had the three-piece transmission cover that you can see there at the front of the tank. You can also see here that applique armor that's in front of the uh, small driver and loader's hatches that's been added for some, uh, for some uh, extra, uh, extra protection. Um, so you can see here a shot of the uh, modifications that were made to the, uh, to the mantlet. Um, to um, allow it to uh, take and, uh, and hold that, uh, that longer and more potent 17 pound uh, gun. So the gun was quite a lot longer than the uh, M3 uh, 75 millimeter that was originally fitted to the Sherman. Um, and there was no capability at the front of the vehicle to have a, um, a traverse lock to, uh, to support the, the gun while it was traveling. So there was a traverse lock that was added to the rear of the, uh, the hull so that the uh, turret would be turned, um, turned rearwards so that that gun could be locked for, uh, for traveling situ situations. Now this 17 pounder is considered by many to be the best allied anti-tank gun of the war, surpassing the 76 mm M1 gun that was mounted to late war Shermans by the Americans, and the 90 mm gun, the M3, that was mounted to the M36 Jackson and the M26 Pershing. Its armor piercing capped ballistic capped round, or the APC BC round, could penetrate 150 mm of 90 degree armor at the range of 1000 meters. Later in 1944, it was also supplied with an even more potent AP round, the AP Discarding Sabo round, that could penetrate uh, 233 millimeters of armor at a thousand uh, meters range, um, allowing it, in theory, to penetrate the armor of even the uh, German uh, Tiger II um, heavy, uh, heavy tank. So they were added to Commonwealth um, uh, platoons or troops that consisted of one Firefly and three Shermans that fitted with the medium velocity gun, and all about 2,100 were, uh, were converted. So that's everything I want to say about the tank. I want to thank you for listening to Bang On About This Vehicle, and I look forward to talking to you soon about another armoured vehicle. And until then, I hope you stay well, and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you very much.